We are starting today with a tough but really important story. Kyle Beach has identified himself as John Doe 1 in the Chicago Blackhawks sexual assault investigation. In an exclusive interview with TSN, Kyle opened up about seeing the coach he alleges abused him celebrate the Stanley Cup. It made me feel like nothing. It made me feel like I didn't exist. It made me feel that I wasn't important. And it made me feel like that he was in the right and I was wrong. I mean, it's just, I, I get teared up. because It's a heartbreaking story. Let's talk about your reaction when you were watching him uh, in this interview last night. Well, where to start, right? There are so many layers of fury and injustice here. Um, but we should focus on Kyle because there are layers to what he has um, experienced. So, of course, the initial abuse and then the fact that nobody did anything about it. But also remember that the abuse in and of itself has ramifications, including on how he dealt with it. This is a top prospect whose career did not come to the fruition that a lot of people expected. That's a dream lost. You know, that is, that is hopes lost. And there's no compensation for that. Um, that is adequate in, in any way. Then on top of that, how many people let him down? And then on top of that, all this is coming out because we're finding out through lawsuits and investigations that another young person was abused by Kyle's abuser because of the inaction of the Chicago Blackhawks, the people Kyle told, and he thought they would take care of it. Um, and then you know, ongoing layers of, of frustration because the NHL is not handling this in any way that is acceptable, not to me and to a lot of people. So for Kyle to come forward, I mean, we saw, Cynthia, you saw that it's very emotional, obviously very courageous. It just, you wish people didn't have to use their courage in this way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking, it's heart-wrenching, and I'd like to say it was a surprising story, but I hate to say it, it's not. Uh, I think wherever you find, you know, we're talking more and more, thankfully, in the media about this, but wherever you find these huge oceans of power differentials, and it's in many industries, it's in, certainly in sports, it's in the movie industry, it's in the, uh, you know, the uh, Catholic Church, for example, church where there's power differentials, you will find abuse. And in particular, what we're talking about more and more is sexual abuse. And the, and the thing that is, you know, that I can't stop thinking about is how extra hard the layers for men, and I'm gonna say men to come forward, and that's why there is this extra piece of courage. It's always courageous to speak out. And yet I think for men it's extra hard because there's this, um, trappings of, of unexpected masculinity and all of the things that that means. And I think there are subtexts and shame um, that is very unique. And, uh, and you know, I, I just don't know what the answer is going forward because to me... I have an how, idea. Okay, yeah, yeah, tell me. What do you think? I thinking? mean, this is a cultural malignancy uh, for men and for women and for anybody who's a victim of any kind of abuse like this. Uh, I think that the first thing that made me stop, as I said, he felt so let down by every person that he thought he could trust to tell, to handle this. And then I realized the bigger the organization, the more conflict of interest there is in somebody who is alleging something like this to tell the very organization who stands to lose by listening mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. And it just dawned on me that the bigger the organization, perhaps, the more of a need there is to have an outside independent agency that handles any kind of concerns, allegations precisely mm -hmm. like this. He went to an organization that was making a run for the Stanley Cup yeah. and he alleges that the upper brass was like, not now, we don't need this distraction. So the very person or people who had the power, to your point, mm -hmm. to do something also had the power to 
make a lot of money and be really successful. So it just it made me stop in my tracks that there is a massive conflict of interest. And the bigger the organization, the more there is to lose. So who's looking out for the victims? Absolutely. Like the bottom line here, and in so many cases, is a multi-million dollar organization, company, corporation, whatever you want to call it, took advantage of its worker and made that person have trauma, made an unsafe workplace environment so that they could make money. That's what it came down to. And when you think about it in that way, it's criminal. It is absolutely criminal that, you know, we have all these rules set in place. If you work in a place that's unsafe because you have to wear steel toe boots or whatever it is, if your boss was, you know, making it unsafe for you, they would get brought down. There would be criminal charges that could be <laughs> brought forward. And that's not that's not how this is seen, you know, when it comes to sports. We put our kids into sports, girls, boys, whatever, and they have these adult coaches. They have these situations where it's like, be a part of the team, don't rock the boat. And I think boys are are, you know, they have that happening and there's all kinds of slippery slopes in there where it's like, it's just locker room talk, it's just locker room behavior. You're, you know, be a boy, man up, all this kind of stuff. So they're all like you're saying that there are different pressures for boys and men in these industries. And then they're playing in these sports leagues that are making a lot more money, frankly, than a lot of women's leagues are. So they are then put in these situations where they're taken advantage of in totally different ways and they have no real way to speak up. And if they do, they're speaking up to the abusers, essentially. I think the which is Well, it's interesting nowhere. that you're bringing up the financial component here, Aisha. You know, you said they're making a lot of money. And, you know, for companies that make a lot of money, we've talked about it so many times on the show about if a, a company screws up and releases a product that is racist, misogynist, we talk about uh, the consumer's right and how the consumer can put pressure on that company to step back and say, I'm not gonna support your business if you continue to do this and you don't change the way that you put out your product. So if you're thinking about the NHL and hockey and these teams as a business, because we just said a lot of money stands to be made, and they have disappointed, I mean, disappointed is even an understatement. They have screwed up in this way. As fans of the sport, for those fans out there, what do you do? What do you ask of your sport and of your team? And how do you redefine what winning and losing means? Mel, you mentioned the Chicago Blackhawks at the time were going for a Stanley Cup. They put the priority of winning the Stanley Cup over and above the well-being of Kyle Beach. Is winning a different way, though? You know, could they have won by saying, you know what, this distraction is actually going to be our priority because we care so much about Kyle Beach. I would like to ask that of fans, myself included, fans of any sport, um, because I think this is culturally a problem within sport, as you said, Cynthia, and beyond. It's interesting that you're saying this. My brain is automatically going to also, like, all the uproar we've had around certain musicians who've been caught doing improper things. Should we listen to their music? Should we not? Movies of Harvey Weinstein, should we not? These are fans mm -hmm. coming forward and saying, you know what, we have to have a reckoning around this. So again, to your point, what are the fans doing? But I go back even further. I think every parent out there is thinking right now, how do I do my best. Obviously, you know, the, the, the onus shouldn't be on the victims. But you as a parent, I, I'm just thinking to myself, like, how do I empower my son, and, or if I had a daughter, it'd be the same thing, <laughs> to make sure that this doesn't happen? Because you are going to encounter power differentials. And if you want to do well in life, if you've found your passion, you're going to do everything you can to make sure that you're part of the team, what Aisha was saying. So we're having hard conversations already. I know you are too, yeah. about like, yes, you have body autonomy. Yes, you can say when something makes you uncomfortable. Yes, you can stand up to power. That you can't, like, and these mm -hmm. are not the messages I got growing up, which was like, respect your elders, don't question teachers, people in authority are always right. We need to blow that up a bit while still also making sure that we're not creating a monster child. So it's this kind of, yeah. it's a very, very complicated and heavy uh, time to think about these types of issues. Yeah. yeah. But I hate to be a dumper on that, Cynthia. Yeah, please. But, you know, Kyle. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, you want to empower children. And Kyle thought he was You're empowered right. to move forward. Mm -hmm. He told the people he was supposed to tell. And mm -hmm. what happened was, as he says, uh, they ignored it. His abuser continued to contribute to the team. And his abuser got to touch and celebrate the Stanley Cup. So it's, yes, empowering people 
to come forward. But also, I think, as Sheldon Kennedy, who blew another sexual abuse case in hockey wide open years ago, has been working on, it's empowerment of the bystander. It's people like us and people in power who know about these things and see it and do nothing. Where is that? Yeah. Well, the I think work the on that. He did everything right. Yeah, he did he everything did. right. And it was the system that let him down and everybody else around him who let him down. So, yeah. Yeah, I think acknowledging that for Kyle Beach as well, that he did everything right. It's not his fault that this is not okay from what everyone else did. And the courage that you mentioned, Lainey, I think that, uh, I think, I hope we, this ushers in some kind of new era for big organizations to say that you can do two things at once. You can still want to win and you can still support mm. the very people who are making your team yeah. at the same time. I, I don't know yes. why there's one at service of the other. Um, anyway, I'm mm -hmm. so glad we tackled uh, this story. And please keep sharing your thoughts on social media as we take our first break here. And on the. <laughs>